Hello, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Chaim Israel, Global Strategies and Head of Thematic Investing in Bank of America Global Securities. I'm so pleased and honored today to be joined by Jack Hilary, the co-founder and CEO of Sandbox, uh, one of the global leaders of AI quantum computing that we're going to speak about today, about the revolution, generative AI. Unless you've been hiding under a rock for the last year or so, this has taken over the world by a storm. And I cannot think about a better person to talk to about the revolution, why the world is going to change with Jack. Thank you so much for joining us today, Jack. We've been all talking about generative AI. We've been discussing the technology. The, you know, the amount of data and discussions around it have really exploded. And I, run, I want to use you to talk about, okay, what's next? How companies should address this technology? What could be the key thing that companies should start looking at? How you vision two, three years down the road, how companies are really implementing technology, where the value can come from, and then we'll take it to other directions. Thanks, Chaim. It's great to be with you here today. We're going to share some thoughts now with the global audience. I wanted to think about, okay, so we spent the last give or take year or so talking about generative AI. I want to talk a little bit about the risks here. Yeah. No, more and more conversations are starting about um, about the risks, about, okay, this is a new technology. It's very new. We don't have the right regulation. We don't have the right framework. We don't have the, no, the misuse yet. Uh, and we're starting to see that ramping quite a lot. And there's more and more discussion. We've seen some of the market leaders signing on letters about let's stop, let's rethink. Personally, I think that's going to, I would hesitate with that. Um, I really want to take what your take. Let's let's outline the risks and talk about okay, how do we confront them? Hi, it's a, it's a critical question. One of the key risks that's not been addressed yet, even with all the conversation about risk, uh, has been the risk in terms of cybersecurity. AI is one of the most powerful tools that humans have ever created, and has the tremendous potential for positive. As we just outlined, we can use it to help us. Uh, transform medicine in other areas, but it also is one of the most powerful tools in the hands of hackers against cybersecurity. Cybersecurity is at the heart of our economy. If you and I want to exchange a credit card, and let's say I want to pay for something at Bank of America using my Bank of America credit card, and I want to use it at Amazon or other e-commerce sites, I depend on cybersecurity. In that case, a particular kind of cyber we call public key encryption. If I want to log into my Bank of America account, I want to go on my mobile app, I want to log in, uh, that password is, is stored at Bank of America, not in clear text. Let's say uh, I have a very simple uh, password. I don't use this password, of course, but let's say it was just, uh, you know, London123 was my password. Of course, Bank of America does not store that as London123. Bank of America and all banks store it in what we call a hashed form, a form that scrambles it up so that if someone found that file, it'd be very difficult to read what that particular password is. But unfortunately, AI is so strong, so getting so good now, that if the hackers penetrate through the firewall and get into the network, and we have to assume that now is the case, all major companies now assume what we call zero trust architecture, or call we call it ZTA. Zero trust says the following. That yes, we try to have firewalls around big corporate networks. We try to have firewalls around the government networks and other sensitive networks around hospitals, uh, you know, with the hospital data, the patient data. But we have to assume the hackers are good enough to penetrate through. That's what we call ZTA, zero trust architecture. So that's the case. We have to assume the hackers now are inside the network. And now we're looking at the password files. AI is getting so good that if the hash table is just a bit off, if that file of passwords is just a bit off in terms of implementation, AI could deduce what some of those passwords are. And so AI is also really good at content generation. We know that from generative AI, and therefore really good at making what? At making spear phishing emails. And an email that goes to Chaim Israel and says, Chaim, uh, this is your IT administrator writing to you, and we are having an issue here in the uh, network and we need your password or we need to call this number or click on this link and it looks really authentic, 
Uh, and then, of course, you may we may actually click on that. So spear phishing. Third threat. AI is really good at taking a little snippet of your voice, not much at all, just a tiny snippet that they can grab from just calling you with a spam call or other ways they can grab your voice and using that to construct an entire Chaim Israel voice that allows uh, them to use your voice to authenticate and to get fraudulent transactions going, to get into your accounts, to use voice authentication and activation. And so these are real threats that AI also represents. And I think organizations, the cybersecurity part of the organizations that are not yet really embracing this threat are at great risk because this is not a future state. This is not something coming in the future that we should write reports about in the future. This is happening right now. The first cases of voice authentication with a stolen voice using AI to reconstruct someone's voice already happened. Uh, the first spear phishing emails that have caught people that were written by AI much better than what humans write already happened. All this has already happened and is happening right now. So I think on the cyber front, so again, there's some other risks of AI that people talk about in terms of runaway AI and things like that. Those are also valid risks to talk about. But here and now, this minute, not in some future state, we must talk about the cyber risks of both AI and of course, of other technologies. Quantum, a very powerful, positive technology, but ultimately we all know that quantum cracks and breaks the public key encryption we just talked about. The ability to take a credit card and safely use it to buy something over the internet. The ability to safely transact over the SWIFT network, ACH network, the fundamental building blocks of our economy. The fact is that the global economy grew by many fold, starting in the 70s and early 80s, primarily because of a number of drivers. But one of the key drivers was the advent of public key cryptography. This is an unsung hero, if we could, Hayam, <laughs> in the story of the global economy that now stands at more than 100 trillion GDP globally per year. This is an unsung hero because without public key cryptography, the ability to transact over the internet, not just personal cards, but also global industries, bank-to-bank -bank transfers, all this enabled by public key cryptography. This is a key area that we cannot let go down. AI and quantum, again, very positive, but also the two biggest threats to cyber we have as well. That's no alarming, but so true that we have to start thinking about that, exactly that we are in this place that we are just about to start implementing and using technology. So I want to take you this question to two different avenues. First of all, okay, we just highlight some of the risks. They are alarming. They could be huge. Companies could be threatened to have, you know, to, to misuse the technology and eventually be very much exposed. A, how companies are dealing with those threats or should deal with those threats. And B, Okay, we have we have governments, we have uh, opinion leaders, we have decision makers that needs to address those risks. What do you see on a governmental, federal level, the work that is being done right now to start confronting those risks? A great question, Haim. I think there's two key things that both governments and companies, management teams need to look at and implement right away. The first is education. We need crash courses, and I know many companies already starting to do this. So there's a couple of leaders that have already separated themselves from the pack that are training their top 100 executives, including the C-suite. They're doing board level training. They're training people in the middle management. They're training engineers. There's a handful of companies in each sector that are taking the lead right now. You could really see the, the leaders and the followers separate out right now because the leaders are investing in boot camp type education, getting their people trained to be aware of these risks and opportunities to make sure they're using Gen AI, but also going beyond Gen AI to the bigger toolbox that we mentioned before, to make sure they're aware of these cyber risks and make sure they're understanding how to protect against the cyber risks. So the first thing I would say is education, number one. Number two, when it comes to the cyber risk specifically, let's start with that. Uh, there are software tools now called encryption management that allow you to take an inventory 
of all the encryption that you use across a large network, like a bank network, a government network, an aerospace automotive company, any large complex global 1000 company, they have large networks. There are now tools um, that really can focus on encryption management. It's an area of cyber high that hasn't really traditionally been looked at. People looked a lot at firewalls, of course. And again, Unfortunately, we have to assume that the hackers get past the firewalls. That's the zero trust architecture assumption now. People have also looked, of course, at malware before. And yes, it's very important to look at viruses and malware. But one of the reasons that ransomware has gone so incredibly out of control, where literally hospitals have been shut down, governments have been shut down, uh, major corporations have been shut down. There was recently, of course, the Las Vegas incidents where uh, hackers took ransom the data and the machinery and the entire access control of the major hotels of the entire city, shutting the entire place down, not just for tourists, but all the business people who are there for their conferences, complete shutdown there. So ransomware is completely out of control now. There are state sponsors, that is nation states, Chaim, whose revenue line includes revenue from ransomware right now. And so how do we protect against that? It's very important to look at the encryption of every single file. The reason why ransomware could be so successful today when hackers hold hostage these files is that the encryption is not as strong as it needs to be. And we need to make sure that's strong. We need to make sure that it's backed up appropriately so that if somebody does get into the network again, assume they will, then ransomware has no effect because you can say, you know what? Keep those files. You can't open them. You can't crack them. And we have copies. So we're good. So you want to inoculate yourself, Haim, as a company. One of your biggest risks as a management team that you have fiduciary responsibility for is to make sure you do not get ransomware. You can just ask now the CEOs of those huge companies that lost literally billions of dollars, both in market cap and in revenue due to ransomware. Not to mention which, obviously trying to pay off these hackers and then continuing the, 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 the terrible cycle. Jen Easterly, the head of CISA, one of the foremost cyber organizations on, uh, you know, in the Western world, is encouraging companies not to pay these, these sums. But again, it's very difficult. So the best thing to do as a management team, any management team listening to us today, Chaim, anyone in a managerial position, leadership position, be it in government or be it in the private sector, uh, at a public company or a private company, we have fiduciary responsibility to make sure we are not subject to ransomware. And, and that means strong encryption, encryption management. Encryption management means inventorying every file, every minute of every day. Not just enough to do it once. You got to have it running 24-7 because obviously all your users are always uploading new files. And so it's important to make that happen 24 seven. So this is a greenfield area of cyber Heim that has not been talked about, uh, not been focused on in the traditional analyst reports on cyber. This is an area that I think and, and want to share with our audience here today to look at, because this is how we can begin to tame the ransomware beast. So to sum up, to answer your question, education, number one, to make sure people understand how to get a hold of these frontier technology toolboxes, Use generative AI, use knowledge graphs, use simulation, use the right tool for the job at the time, combine the tools together for positive value, for growth, for productivity gains, but also education around the risks, not only the far-term risks that was talked about in recent conferences, but the immediate, today urgent risk on the cyber front of AI and other advanced technologies that can crack in to these networks. Um, that's amazing. And touching base on the regulation, regula regulatory point of view, the work that needs to be done. We know that technology is advancing very, very fast. We know that for regulators all over the world, usually they play a catch up. Uh, but the revolution is happening so fast that I don't think anyone has the luxury to wait and just examine and case studies and so on. So where do you see the regulators advancing and, and approaching this? Well, the good news, Haim, is that many regulatory agencies are taking a step forward. 
They're engaging in dialogue. They're calling companies like ourselves and many others uh, to, to have engagement. Uh, I was at a uh, a large government office this morning, in fact, uh, in such a dialogue. And so the, the dialogues are happening. That's a piece of good news. I think that regulators are appropriately trying to strike a balance of not over-regulating, but also having some regulation go into place right now. Where I see a need for more attention is on the cyber front. Uh, CISA, the organization I mentioned before, and its counterparts uh, in Europe and the UK uh, are taking a strong look at how to stem the tide of ransomware. But I think that we need to do more there. We need more regulation when it comes to looking at the standards at which a publicly listed company is held to in terms of the uh, inventory and the standard at which they understand the risk that they have on a zero trust basis. The White House issued two executive orders already in the last few years on zero trust. If people just go on to a search engine and type in zero trust, cybersecurity and executive order of the White House, you'll find these texts very, very clear to understand actually, uh, and, and well-written, I have to say. Uh, other organizations in the UK and continental Europe have also started to issue advisories uh, in this area. But right now, they've really just been just that, executive orders and advisories. We need to get some more teeth into the system in order to make sure that we are holding accountable the organizations around the world that are the critical industries, healthcare, banking, energy, the grids, uh, all these telephony, telcos, all these critical industries. It's very important that we raise the bar in terms of how we set our sights on the cyber front. Uh, again, we, we love these new technologies with, the, with many positive things will come cornucopias of positivity uh, and abundance, but we must raise the bar on cyber. So I want to raise the alarm today, Chaim, on this call that we have right now, even with all the discussions of risk that have happened related to AI over the past year, we have not heard this part of the message yet. Thank you so much for your time. And I can't wait for the next chapter. Thanks, Chaim.